All right, gang, we're gonna officially pick up the central limit theorem for the sampling distribution of X bar. There's gonna be some rules that we're gonna go over and you're gonna hear me refer to this phrase, this, these assumptions. It's the first time we'll see this assumption pop up and these assumptions will show up for the rest of our chapters. They'll show up in this chapter seven and we'll see them in eight, nine, 10, 11, and 13. So this is the first time we're seeing these assumptions pop up, but they're gonna be super important. They're gonna play themselves out for the rest of the semester. So let's pick up these rules. They're gonna seem a little confusing or maybe a lot confusing. Um, I'm gonna show you the mechanics of how they play out in examples three and four. And then we're gonna look at an applet that'll hopefully just deepen our understanding of what on earth is happening here, okay? So here we go. Here are the general properties for the sampling distribution for X bar. And the, the things that I'm about to say, you can find in this column, all right, that column on your trait table. All of these properties are in here, but we're gonna start picking these up one at a time, okay? All right, so let X bar denote the mean of the observations in a random sample of size N from a population having mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Denote the mean value of the X bar distribution. All right, so when I say X bar distribution, I'm talking about the sampling distribution by mu sub X bar and the standard deviation of the X bar distribution by mu sub X, excuse me, sigma of X bar. And sometimes you'll hear me refer to this as the standard error. The following rules hold. All right, so this, this first rule is saying the center for your sampling distribution is the same as the center of your population distribution. So let me put this out in words, okay? Center, actually I need a little bit more space. All right, center of your sampling distribution is equal to the center of your population distribution. Okay. And that might seem weird or a little out there, but we actually saw that play out in both examples one and two. So while you're writing that down, I just wanna remind you that the center for our population distribution in example one, right? That center was 8.25. What was the centers for all of our sampling distributions? About 8.25, right? And the same was true for example two. We had all of those hockey games. And if you remember the population center, was it about 10 minutes, right? And the centers for all of our sampling distributions were also at about 10 minutes. All right, so whatever the center for your population distribution, that means your sampling distribution is gonna be at the exact same number or pretty darn close to it. All right, this is saying that the standard deviation for your sampling distribution, or we might refer to that as the standard error, it's gonna be your original population distribution divided by the square root of n. So let me, let me go ahead and write this out. So this is saying the standard deviation of your sampling distribution all right, is the same as the standard deviation of your population distribution divided by the square root of n. And as you're writing that down, let's think about this. Your square root of n, that's in your denominator, okay? And go back to your math days. Whenever you had a denominator that was really large, your fraction actually got a lot smaller, right? So as your denominator increases, the reciprocal of that number decreases. So what I mean by that is if you look at the fraction one half, let me clear this out, one half, right? That's the number 0.5. My denominator was only two here. Let's increase that denominator to 100. 
do you see how the fraction is actually now much smaller, right? It went from 0.5 down to 0.01. And if I increase that denominator even more, let's make it one divided by 250, you can see that decimal gets even smaller and smaller and smaller. So as your denominator gets larger, that, that fraction gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Or how you've seen this play out so far is as sample size increases, this measure of variability is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we saw that play out in both examples one and examples two, right? Or example two, excuse me. We saw that we had our population distribution had this spread here. And as sample size increased, my variability got smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's actually governed by this formula. Okay, and that played out again with the platelet example and the hockey example. Okay. And I had said previously, we have to figure out when we can put the approximately normal symbol on here, on your, on your sampling distribution. And there are two ways to potentially get normality, to potentially put that squiggles with the N. Here's the first one. If your population distribution is normal, then your sampling distribution is normal for any sample size. Okay, so think about assumption one, and that relates to example one. So what I mean by that, when our population distribution was approximately normal, we could say that the sampling distribution, all four of these were approximately normal, regardless of the sample size. So I could put the little squiggles in on all four of these because our population distribution was normal. All right, that is one way to get normality in mean land. So if your population distribution is normal, you're set. You don't have to worry about anything else. You can put the, the squiggles in on your sampling distributions. Okay. Now what do we do when our population distribution is not normal? And that's what we saw in example two. Here's the central limit theorem. When n is, and I'm going to put quotes, sufficiently large, the sampling distribution for the means is approximated by a normal curve, even when the population distribution is not itself normal. Okay. The CLT can be safely applied when n is 30 or larger. Okay. Now I'm going to, I put sufficiently large in quotes because this, this phrase is going to change depending on whether you're looking at averages or whether you're looking at proportions or when we get to um, more than two categorical variables or more than two averages. This, this will keep on changing as we progress through the chapters. But for right now, when you're looking at means, all right, sufficiently large means 30 or higher. So what I mean by that is, for example, two, our population distribution was not normal. All right. And when we looked at our sampling distributions, I could not officially say any of these were approximately normal until I got here, until the CLT kicked in, because I was at 30 or higher. And that's why I said when n was 30, I actually could put the squiggles n. And if you're wondering, why, why do we care about the squiggles n? Why do we care if the distributions are normal? Because once you know something is approximately normal, you can start using normal CDF and calculating probabilities. All that stuff we learned back in chapter six can now be applied. And we are obsessed with figuring out when things are approximately normal. So for example, I couldn't use normal CDF here, here, or here, but I could use it here, okay? Because the central limit theorem had kicked in. And conversely, on example one, if I was asked to calculate any probabilities, I could use it on any four of these because they were all approximately normal. Okay? So there are two ways to get normality in mean land. All right? And I'm going to put this here. Only one of the assumptions needs to be met in order to continue. And this will absolutely change when we get to proportion land. Okay? So just keep in mind, start to separate the world, mean land versus proportion land. All right, but when we're in mean land, right, and I have it right here, how do you assess normality? Either the population distribution is stated as normal or approximately normal, or the sample size is at least 30, and the CLT kicks in. And at least 30 means greater than or equal to 30. All right, and when that's the case, you can see here that I can put the X bar is approximately normal, the mean is the same as the population distribution, but the standard deviation gets divided by the square root of n. And that's the graph that we're going to make. Okay. So with these mechanics, with these rules, let's see if we can play them out in a couple of multiple choice examples. All right, so as I read example three, let's see if we can figure out 
what, what on earth am I talking about? There's gonna be a lot of numbers thrown out at us. I want us to start to manage what was on the population distribution, what was on the sampling distribution, okay? So let's, let's scooch this up and see, actually, I'm gonna scooch this down a little. I wanna make sure that we have the rules. I think I can see the rules there. All right, so let's, let's get that. And now that we can see the rules and the assumptions, let's, let's take a look at example three. So it says, what are the mean and the standard deviation of a sampling distribution consisting of samples of size 16? These samples were drawn from a population whose mean is 25 and whose standard deviation is five. All right, so a lot of words in there. So what are the mean and standard deviation of a sampling distribution? Okay, so when it says what are the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution, they are asking us to figure out, all right, we are on a sampling distribution. It says it right here, sampling distribution. And I'm gonna tell you we're not in proportion land yet, so we're just gonna follow this column. I want the mean and the standard deviation. So I wanna find a mu, a sigma, and an n. All right, so if I can find those three things, then I can crunch these two numbers. So they're asking us for a mean and a sigma over square root n, okay? And it says they were drawn from a population whose mean was 25 and whose standard deviation was five. All right, so to try and attack these problems, you're gonna see me draw uh, or mark off things for the population distribution and things for the sampling distribution. So here's what I mean by that. I wanna make sure we have the notation down. When I talk about the population distribution, I'm talking about x. When I'm talking about the sampling distribution for averages, I'm talking about x bar. And if you're wondering, well, how, how are you able to distinguish which sampling distribution you're on? Because how will I eventually know if I'm talking about means or proportions? Well, you can see the word mean is all over the place here. Well, not all over, but it's here. All right, so I've got averages and averages. Okay, so here we go. So I'm gonna put squiggles for each of these and I'm gonna put a bunch of question marks. So I'm gonna say, I don't know the shape. Do I know the mean? Do I know the standard deviation? Okay, do I know the shape, the mean, or the standard deviation? So you're gonna see me frequently start with six question marks and then I'm gonna see what I can fill in. All right, so when I say question marks, can I put the N here on either one of these and we'll, we'll evaluate it. Do I know the mean, the center? Do I know the standard deviation? Okay. Now this question is asking us for these two numbers. I'm gonna see what I can fill in. So let's look at this sentence. It says these samples were drawn from a population, so that's talking about X, whose mean is 25, and whose standard deviation is five. Okay. So that's what I know about the population. I was given no information on its shape. Nowhere in here does it say normal, it doesn't say skewed right, doesn't say uniform, doesn't say anything. So I'm gonna leave this as a question mark, okay? Now I want these two numbers, so let's see what we can say about X bar. What does the central limit theorem or the properties of the sampling distribution tell me? Okay, so here we go. If I want information about X bar, I want the mean, it says, the mean is the same as the population distribution. Okay, so that means if the population distribution had an average of 25, then the sampling distribution should also have an average of 25. Now again, we saw this in example one. The average platelet size for the population distribution was 8.25 micrograms, and the average for all of the sampling distributions was also 8.25 micrograms. We saw it in example two. The average hockey playoff game for the population was 9.8 minutes, and that was the same for all of our sampling distributions. So whatever number that you find for the center of your population, just drop it into the population for your sampling distribution. And at that point, I can rule out C and D, okay? Now, let's figure out how we go from the standard deviation for the population distribution to the standard error. Again, when I say standard error, it's just the number down here, the standard deviation for the sampling distribution. All right, so what is the rule? The rule says if I want the standard error, or the standard deviation, take your population distribution and divide it by the square root of n. All right, so my population distribution was five. 
and my sample size, let's see how, how many folks were in my sample, or I don't even know if it's people, but it says samples of size 16. So I'm gonna erase this, and I'm gonna take my original population distribution, and I'm gonna divide it by the square root of 16. Now when I crunch that number on my calculator, maybe you can see it already, and maybe you can't, that's fine. I'm gonna do five divided by the square root of 16, and that is 1.25. So that tells me my answer, A. All right, with that, I wanna talk, I wanna go a little bit further and I wanna talk about both of these assumptions, okay? So the question will come up, can we consider the sampling distribution approximately normal? So what that's asking is, can I put the N there? All right, can I put approximately normal? And again, the reason we wanna put the N here is because once we put the N here, we can start using normal CDF and calculating probabilities, okay? Now, in mean land, there's a couple of ways to get normality. So let's, let's get these assumptions in view and talk about them. All right, when the population distribution is normal, the sampling distribution for means is also normal for any sample size. All right, so let's look at the population distribution. I don't know that it was normal. It was not stated and I have no information on that. So I want you to see for assumption one, it was not met. All right, all right. So there was, I'm gonna just put an X by it. It wasn't met, all right, and I'll just put no info given on shape, oops, given on shape of population distribution. So that one wasn't met, that's unfortunate. Let's see if the central limit theorem could apply. So in, in average or in mean land, all right, when n is sufficiently large, we can throw in the approximately normal. And sufficiently large here means 30 or larger for the sample size. So let's think about assumption number two. All right, did I meet assumption number two? So my sample size was 16 here. 16 is not at least 30. All right, so I'm gonna say this one was also not met. All right, because n was only 16, which is not greater than or equal to 30. And I need one of the assumptions to be met in order to continue, in order to put the n here. So the overall answer to this question, can we consider the sampling distribution for the means approximately normal? No. The reason it's no is because neither assumption one nor assumption two was met. And really what that ultimately means is if you ask me to calculate a probability, if you went a step further and said, what's the probability that the sample mean is between, I don't know, 20 and 30, I couldn't do it. I would have to stop the problem, okay? All right, so with that, let's take a look at example four. Okay, so oops, let me get that into view a little bit better. All right. So it says the mean TOEFL score of international students at a certain university is normally distributed with a mean of 490 and a standard deviation of 80. Suppose that groups of 30 students are studied. The mean and standard deviation for the distribution of sample means respectively will be blank. All right, so a lot of information just came out at us. I'm gonna read this again. And this one has some context. So let's be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem. So the average TOEFL score of international students at a certain university is normally distributed with a mean of 490 and a standard deviation of 80. Suppose that groups of 30 students are studied. The mean and standard deviation for the distribution of sample means respectively will be blank and blank. All right, so I can hear a bunch of buzzwords. Let's, let's start highlighting the buzzwords. I hear mean of 490. I hear standard deviation of 80. I hope we saw normally distributed. All right, and then I see groups of 30 students. Okay. So I'm gonna put a bunch of question marks. All right, I'm gonna talk first about population distribution. And then I wanna talk about the sampling distribution. 
Actually, let me write these a little lower. I want to make space to write my um, variable. All right, so let's talk about our variable. I think we can see here when we're talking about 490, all right, what was our variable? What does 490 represent? Does it represent apples, friends, hamburgers? No, it, it represents your TOEFL score. All right, and this is a, a test that you give to international students to see where they place at university. So I'm gonna assume the units here are points. All right, so when we talk about the population, we're gonna talk about X. When we talk about the sampling distribution for means, we're gonna talk about X bar. And if you're, again, wondering, well, how do I know I'm in mean land? I see the word mean written all over. All right, when you're in proportion land, you'll either see proportions or your variable will be categorical. But whenever you have a numerical variable, you're gonna look at averages. All right, so I'm gonna put my six question marks and I'm gonna see what I can deduce from that. So do I know the shape of the population? Do I know the center? Do I know the standard deviation? Do I know the shape of my sampling distribution? Do I know the center? Do I know the standard deviation? All right, let's see what we can figure out here. So it tells me the population distribution, it's normally distributed. I know the shape, so I'm gonna put the N here. I know the mean, that's 490, so let me put 490 there. And I think you can see I also know the standard deviation, so I'm gonna put 80. So we've got 490, comma, 80, great. All right, now let's see what I can figure about, out about the sampling distribution. So I actually know more about this population distribution than I did in example three. All right, so let's, let's follow the rules for the sampling distribution. All right, so the rule for the mean says it's the same center as the population distribution. So if those international students score an average of 490, all right, if one student's average is about 490, then when I take a random sample of 30 students, I still expect that average to be around 490. Okay, once I know the 490 drops, you can see B gets eliminated and C gets eliminated. All right, let's think about the standard deviation. I know as sample size increases, variability will decrease. And when you're talking about the population, you're talking about one student at a time. The sampling distribution, I'm looking at the average score of 30 students. So let's see what the rule says. The rule for the standard error says I should take my population distribution and divide by the square root of the sample size. So in this case, my population distribution, or my population standard deviation was 80. I'm going to divide by the square root of my sample size, which is 30. Let's see what that number is. All right, it's looking like 14.606. And looking at the answers, we only went two decimals, so I'll say 61. So at this point, I know C is my answer. All right, but I do want to take it a step further, which is why I asked this. Can we consider the sampling distribution for X bar approximately normal? So let's see if we meet either of assumption one or two. And really, I only have to meet one of these. All right, in terms of assessing normality in mean land, it's the easiest land to do it in. It's way till you get to proportion land. It's a lot more cumbersome, but I need one or the other. So I need the population distribution stated as normal, or I need the sample size 30 or higher to get the CLT to kick in. So let's look, was our population stated as normal? Yes, I had the N here. So assumption number one is met. All right, and that's it. I could, I could stop here. I don't even have to check assumption number two. All right, I can put the N there, which means if you ask me for a probability, I can use normal CDF. We're good to go. Now. Just for the sake of assessing it, let's look at assumption number two. But I want to be clear, as soon as one of these assumptions are met, you can put the end down and call it a day. All right, let's see if assumption number two is met. Did the central limit theorem apply? 
was my sample size at least 30? Or another way of saying that was my sample size greater than or equal to 30? And what was my sample size? 30. So assumption number two is also met because 30 is greater than or equal to 30. So the overall answer to this question, can we consider the sampling distribution for X bar approximately normal? Yes. And that would mean I could use normal CDF to calculate some probabilities. Okay. So with that, I want us to take a look at an applet. There's a link to it on your lecture notes, but I'm going to have us look at that video together um, for the next video. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye.